great to be here on the Lord's day in the Lord's house. And um, if you would, please open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 19. Um, a little over a year ago, I did a couple of weeks on Lot. And some of you will remember that Lot is Abraham's nephew. And Abraham takes Lot under his wing, and he takes him on this incredible spiritual journey from uh, Padanaram to uh, what we now know as uh, the, the, uh, the promised land, the land of Canaan. And then there's this whole journey down to Egypt, and th there's a whole lot that takes place, right? And Lot is with Abraham, and Lot is spiritually codependent on Abraham. And we, we talked about how you know, over, a little over a year ago, we detailed all of these little things about Lot that made him ultimately an unconvincing witness of what the Lord wanted to do through the Abraham family. Uh, and we see that unconvincing witness play out in Lot's wife. Uh, and now that we've come from the position of talking about Lot's wife, we're now talking about excuse me, from Lot. We're now talking about Lot's wife. And actually what drove me to this passage all that time ago wasn't actually Lot at all. I wanted to talk to you guys about Lot's wife, and here we are now. We're talking about Lot's wife, finally. And today we'll finish that. And so uh, it was called, the, the message on Lot was called Lessons from Lot, and this message now is called Lessons from Edith. And we started that last week, and we're going to finish it today. So it's Lessons from Edith. Uh, part two. Um, so that brings us to today. And you might be thinking, well, where did the, the, the name Edith come from? If you weren't here last week, I'll give you a, look, look, a quick history of that. The, the name Edith comes from uh, the, the rabbinic tradition, right? The, the, the rabbis decided, even though that the Lord and Moses sought fit to leave Lot's wife unnamed, the rabbis decided to give her a name and they gave her the name Edith. And so that's where we get that from. And last week, the lesson that we learned from Edith was this. Don't live under divine grace, the divine grace of God, but turn your heart from him. Don't live under the divine grace of God, but turn your heart from him. God, on multiple occasions, we detailed three. On multiple occasions, he extended his hand of grace directly to Edith. And she experienced the benefit of being underneath that grace. But as we discovered last week, her heart was indifferent to him. And her heart ultimately betrayed her in the biggest way. And we're going to talk about that today. So Genesis chapter 19, picking up in verse 15. Uh, and when we step into this narrative, you should know that the messengers, the men from God, the, 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 I should say the angels from the Lord, had already come to Sodom on a rescue mission to rescue Lot's family. And the evil men of Sod Sodom have already sought to do their unspeakable things to these messengers, these angels from the Lord. And uh, if, if, if any of you guys have ever read that story, you know the evil things that I'm talking about. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of detail that a little bit more later. But it says this in verse 15. At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now, or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. When Lot still hesitated, the angels seized his hands and the hands of his wife and two daughters and rushed them to safety outside the city, for the Lord was merciful. And when they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Oh no, my Lord, Lot begged. You have been so gracious to me and have saved my life, and you have shown such great kindness, but I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there, and I would soon die. And see, there is a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said. I'll grant your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry. 
escape to it, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. This explains why the village is known as Zoar, which means little place. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, He utterly destroyed them along with the other cities and villages of the plain, wiping out all the people in every bit of vegetation. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, I wanted to read this in full context so that we could understand the narrative as it is running in order. Our two lessons are actually found in verse 26. I want to talk to you about how we should not look back and how we should not lag behind. I want to begin in reverse order. I want to start with the second one, and that is don't lag behind. I think the first, well, the second, including last week's, the second lesson that we learned from Edith is don't lag behind. That is, don't be reluctant to live a godly life. Or in Edith's case specifically, it would be don't be reluctant to live the secluded life as Edith and Lot have so clearly demonstrated that they didn't want to live the secluded life. They didn't want to live in the mountains, in the plains, and even on their rescue mission (laughs) that they're being pulled out of this, this place that is going to come underneath God's judgment and completely and utterly destroyed. Even in the process of that mission, Lot is still unwilling to live the life that God had called the Abraham family to live, to, uh, live under, and that is a life of seclusion, which in that day was the equivalent of a life of holiness, being set apart in proximity, literally set apart from uh, the ways of and, and the people of the world. And so, don't be reluctant to live a godly life. Now, on this rescue mission, as we've just read it, I want us to notice where Edith is. Where is she on this journey out of Sodom and now towards Zoar? Is she ahead of the angels that are leading her out? Is she ahead of her husband, Lot, as they're making their way to Zoar? No, she's not. Is she shoulder to shoulder with them, excited about where they're going, at least at the very least grateful about being rescued from a place that's going to be utterly destroyed? No, she's not. She's lagging behind. I mean, look at the, 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 the text in your Bible as it plays out. Lot got to Zoar way back in verse 23, and where's Edith? She's still on her way. She hasn't made it yet. God has destroyed two cities and a whole a whole. Uh, plain of the Jordan, right? And the time it took for Edith to just be mentioned that she's still lagging behind. And I think it's her pace. Her pace says a lot about where her heart is. And she was being rescued from destruction into safety, into a, 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 a front, being rescued away from a life separated from God to a life separated from the world, and she was behind. And Lot arrived early. And don't be reluctant. Don't be reluctant to live the life that Jesus is calling you into. You know, this reminds me of the precursor to the Lord's Supper. Um, Jesus turns to the large crowds who were following him at that moment. To that moment, following Jesus was no difficult thing. He had been healing people left and right. He had been uh, uh, multiplying loaves and fishes and and, uh, feeding the masses. He had been teaching deep and profound, wise things, and there hadn't been any real friction in following Jesus. And yet that all changed the moment he turns to them and says, unless you eat my flesh, and drink my blood, you can have no part in the eternal life that I'm offering you. You, can't, you, you. There is no, you can't have eternal life. The masses 
were turned off by the disgusting thought of what he had just said. And to do that would be to break dozens of the laws of Moses in the most devastating way. So the masses turned away. And the thing that piques my interest in the context of our story today is the literal proximity of the ones who stuck around. When the masses left, who stayed? The 12 stayed. The ones that were closest stayed. As a matter of fact, Jesus even turns to the 12 and he says, are you two going to leave me? Are y'all going somewhere too? Are you going to abandon me? And I think it's Peter who says, Lord, where else can we go? You're the only one who has the words of eternal life. The 12 were close enough in proximity, not only sort of metaphorically speaking, but also literally speaking, to have the insight and the knowledge that Jesus is the only way. You see, the masses were attracted to Jesus by what he could potentially do for them in this world to make their lives a little bit better, to perhaps make their lives a little bit easier, to, to heal them, to provide for them, to, to meet some of their immediate needs that they have. But the 12, the 12 were dedicated to him, even though it meant they would certainly experience difficulty in this life. And that is the distinction of proximity. The disciple who is close, the disciple who isn't lagging behind, has made up his mind that, this is, that Jesus is the only option for me, that nothing else that this world has to offer is ever going to meet the promise that Jesus has made for me. And I believe the promise. I believe he will come through for me. Notice that it's the disciples closest to him that make it through this test of faith. And make no mistake, this suggestion of what can only be characterized as cannibalism was certainly a test of faith for a first century Jew and for really for anybody. What a massive test of faith that would be. And the discipline, excuse me, the disciple who is lagging behind, who lacks the discipline to be close in proximity, the disciple who is still at some distance away from Jesus, who's still within the conflict of deciding if life in Christ and what Jesus has on offer is really for them, you know, they, they might have thought they decided to follow Jesus. And, and after all, they're on the right trail, but they're, they're a little bit far back. And, and in my view, I think they're vulnerable to, uh, to this kind of a test, of being swept away in this kind of a test, of following away when a real test of life comes. And when following Jesus, albeit at a distance, becomes difficult, or even when defending the words and the ways of Jesus becomes a pain point, they will find themselves, this disciple who is at a distance, they will find themselves at serious risk of turning away from the only true source of eternal life. And that is why I think in recent years, we have seen this deconstruction movement take place in our culture in America and even in all the Western world. It's gained a lot of traction. And people are deconstructing their faith. You know who else deconstructed their faith? The masses when Jesus said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They're de deconstructing. When it gets difficult, when the, when the, when the pain is really there, the, pa the pain point comes and we will see that happen more and more as time marches on and as we see the current trajectory of where uh, our sort of uh, moral landscape as it is ever shifting continues to do so. I want to know, Harvest Hill, are we the ones that stick around? Are we close enough? Are we like the 12? 
or are we like the masses? Only you can answer that. Only you can really know. Only you can, 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 well, you and Jesus, of course. And if you're not sure, you should ask him. He'll let you know. But are you, are you close enough, like in proximity to him? When that storm comes, are you still going to be able to see him in the, in the fog? Are you close enough to see him in the fog? That's the question. Don't lag behind. One day, there will be that moment where the final day of judgment comes. And when that day comes, if you're still caught in indecision about whether or not the life that Jesus has on offer is really for you, and that is some kind of indication as how far back you are in following him, the decision will be taken out of your hands. The decision will no longer be yours. You will have, in effect, made your decision by indecision. But I want us to turn our attention back to Edith now. Her body was rescued from the fire and the brimstone, at least momentarily. But her heart, her hopes, her her dreams, her desires, her vision that she had for her life was still back in Sodom. And those are the factors, those things, the vision, the dreams, the desires, those are the very things that affected her pace towards rescue, towards where God was leading them out and leading them to. I wish that she would have known the good news about our good Father in heaven. I do. I wish that Edith would have known the good news about our good father in heaven. And that is, and this is news that Abraham certainly knew. And I think that it's news that Lot knew because he belonged to the the family of Abraham and he had experienced so much of the goodness of God. And that is that God is the great redeemer of our vision and of our plans, and of our hopes, and of our dreams. He, he can redeem whatever those things are, those true, deep longings within that you would like to see happen in your life and have a vision for your life, so long as they're not contrary to what God wants to do on the earth, is so long as they're submitted to the good Father, he can actually take those things and redeem them and make them actually worth having. If you formed a vision for your life apart from the input and shaping of the God of heaven, you have no idea what you're missing out on. Even the best laid plans that you could possibly conceive of pale in comparison to the vision that God has for you and the satisfaction of the soul that comes along with living the life that God has preordained for you to live. If we could only believe that, if we could truly get that in our hearts, there would be no need to be lagging behind some be in the middle of the, the valley when, when, when Lot's already at Zoar. Lot's already there. Edith is way back here because Edith can't see a life in Zoar. She can't see a life apart from Sodom. She's stuck. She's lagging behind. And that's a tragic thing. And this story reminds me of one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes. And he says this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. God has a holiday at the sea on offer for us. 
And yet we want to hold on to that which we know, that which we think is best, that which we, the highest thing that we can possibly imagine for our lives. And it's okay to be excited about things that you have an internal longing for, but be willing to let go of those things and trust that God can do something bigger and better with those things than you can possibly imagine. And he might even shape some of them. He might even cut some of those things out, but, but he's the, 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 the perfect pruner in all of life. I wonder if you allow God, if you're allowing God in your life right now to prune some of the things, some of your hopes, some of your dreams, some of your internal desires, are you, are you allowing God to be the gardener of your soul? He is a good, good father. The essential truth that's really worth thinking deeply about is that if your vision for your life and God's vision for your life aren't the same, you're going to be lagging behind as Jesus is rescuing you from this world. Don't lag behind. Too many Christians, even would-be Christians, lag behind. They're reluctant to live a life in Christ because they have the wrong idea about what it's going to be like. One of the most productive lies the devil has been able to achieve in our culture today is that the Christian life isn't worth having, and that is a lie. The Christian life is a fantastic life. The Christian life, as it is detailed in Scripture and, in scripture and by my estimation, is, is the perfect cross-section between all of the impactful elements that, that there is to life. It's the perfect cross-section of purpose and principles. It's the perfect cross-section of fulfillment and duty. It's the perfect cross-section between meaning and presence, love and community, and discipline and encouragement, humility and self-worth, sacrifice and satisfaction, acceptance and accountability, reverence and adventure it's a great life if you haven't yet found that perfect cross-section that I've just described there as I would say most of us are on that journey I would just say that so long as you are following Jesus these are the places that he's taking you into into those cross-sections into those places where the soul is most satisfied where your heart the longings of your heart are being met by the only one who can actually satisfy why are so many people modern people reluctant to live this life it's because they've been tricked into thinking that they can manage their own heart and soul better than Jesus can. And the same exact problem is true in Edith's story, and it caused her to lag behind. So the second lesson of Edith is don't lag behind. Don't be reluctant to live the godly life that that Jesus has on offer. Or in Edith's case, don't be reluctant to live the secluded life. Number three, and finally, don't look back. Don't look back. That was the warning that the angel gave to the family of Lot. Don't look back. And the word used here in Hebrew actually carries with it the connotation that she looked back, but it's not just that she looked back, that she looked back longingly. And that's the word that carry, that's the Hebrew word. It carries that longing element to it. And by now, we've well established that though her body was rescued out of Sodom, her heart is still there. And this is yet another evidence of that. The big problem for Edith was that on that day, that was her judgment day. Her heart was put to the test. It was judged. And on that day, it was found wanting. She never came around to the idea of living a life in the tradition of Abraham, dedicated to God and the things of God. And here we see her heart 
betray her, and I said this earlier, but I'll say it again, betray her in the biggest way because at that moment of weakness, the longing which existed within led to a glance over her shoulder, and she was instantly judged, and instantly she became a pillar of salt. Today in Israel, there is an actual pillar of salt that in some small way could be seen to take the form of a woman. And I think I have that picture, if if you'll put that up there. It has this this structure here, this, this thing you see behind me is made of salt. And it has been nicknamed Lot's wife. Now, is it literally Lot's wife? Probably not. It is, after all, nine feet tall. (laughs) But it serves as a clear reminder of her story. This pillar of salt is situated on a cliff looking from above, not far, where archaeologists believe that the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah now sit. Now, before I tell you where Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is situated, let me remind you that the Bible tells us that this was a place of lush, fertile soil. It says this, it was like the well-watered garden of the Lord or the beautiful lands of Egypt. This is how Sodom and Gomorrah is described. But now what remains of Sodom and Gomorrah have been drowned at the center of and some of you may have guessed it, I actually heard somebody say it, of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is appropriately named because it's a place where absolutely no life whatsoever can live. No fish, no plant life, nothing. Nothing can live in the Dead Sea. And we know God judged Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. You might find it interesting to learn that brimstone is just an old term for what we call sulfur today. And the Dead Sea has such a sulfur deposit that people in the 10th century mined the Dead Sea for sulfur commercially. But it's not necessarily the sulfur that makes the Dead Sea, well, dead. It's certainly part of it, but it's not the whole story. It's the salt, which to me inextricably links Edith to the Dead Sea, both literally and metaphorically. But as I look at all of the details and the facts that are surrounding this geographical anomaly, there is nowhere else like this Dead Sea in the world. It's hard not to see. For me, it's hard not to see God's message in this. And that is is that if God judges a people, it's because there's no life. It's dead. What they're doing is dead. There's no life in what they're doing. There's no life in the evil practices of Sodom. There's no life in homosexuality. There's no life in hedonism. There's no life in indulgence to the flesh above all else. That's the message to the world. And this geographical anomaly that there's no other place like this on the earth serves as a testament to that reality. God's message still stands today. There's still no life in the Dead Sea. And Sodom is drowned in the middle of it. Man, if that's not a message to the people of the earth, I don't know what is. What a powerful demonstration of what it is that he's trying to say to us. The message for Lot's wife is, don't look back. There's nothing there that's worth having. There's only death back there. Don't look back. It's not for you. And God had such a better plan for her being rescued back to the family of Abraham, back to seclusion, back to holiness. He had prepared a way of escape for you, Edith, but you didn't take it. You were fooled by a dead culture with hollow promises of freedom 
and good times. You were tricked by Satan into trading life with God, the hope of glory, for death everlasting. And to serve as a monument of death made of salt that makes the Dead Sea unsustainable for life. I think that every Christian in the room, if they were honest, they would say, there's been a moment, maybe two, maybe three, maybe a dozen, where I've been tempted to look back, to, to go back to the way things were before encountering Jesus, to slip back into the easy life of detachment from God's plan for you and to capitulate to the pressure of self-indulgence and sin. If you have been tempted to give up on God, I want you to listen to me. There is nothing back there for you. Don't look back. Life represents that which is good that which is right, that which is true, and that which is worth having. And there is no life back there for you. It is only death. If you find yourself being tempted to look back, I want you to remember and think about this very important phrase. And that is this. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. You know who said that? Jesus said that. Luke chapter 17, remember Lot's wife. He was teaching on the second coming with two goals in mind. First was to inform his disciples of what the second coming would look like and what it wouldn't look like. And secondly, his his second goal was to convince them that the world only has death on offer. And that's it. His goal was to effectively detach their hearts from this world and to secure it for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has prepared a way of escape for you. Escape from the judgment that's coming to this world and the eternal death that that judgment brings. Remember Lot's wife. There's nothing back in that world that you came out of that's worth having. Jesus rescued you from that place for a reason. It's because it was horrible. It was awful. It may have been easier in some ways to not have to feel the pressure of holiness, to not have to feel the pressure of living a godly lifestyle. The Christian lifestyle isn't always easy, but it's better. Life in Christ isn't necessarily easy. Just ask some of the people that we've been studying in this past quarter. Ask Corey Ten Boom. Ask ask Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Ask Jim Elliott. Ask Nate Saint, people that we've talked about recently. And taking up your cross daily isn't easy. Just ask any Christian who takes God's emphasis on holiness seriously. Living a lifestyle of repentance and self-denial isn't easy, but it's better. It's better. Now, maybe you're here and you're not a believer or you're one of these people who is probably on the right track, but you're way back in the distance in the crowd you're in severe risk of being swept away by the next difficult saying of Jesus. Maybe that's you and you're thinking, well, I don't know, preacher. This life I live is not so easy. I wouldn't say that it's easy to live away from Christ. And to that I say, you're absolutely right. It's a different kind of heart, isn't it? It's the, it's the kind of heart It's the kind of hard life for the destruction of the soul instead of a hard life for the building up of the soul. And there's a saying that's so true and applies here now, and that is, choose your heart. Many of us have heard this saying, and it's very true. There is no path in life where you won't encounter hard times. And choose your heart. And choose the life where you're going to choose hard for the building up of your spirit and of your soul. For the building up of your character to become more like Christ and less like the evil world that we're being rescued from. Choose your heart. 
because life apart from Christ is devastatingly hard in the worst kind of ways. I want to invite the worship team to come forward as we end. In Luke chapter 17, immediately following uh, the moment where he tells his disciples to remember Lot's wife, he, he says this, and I want y'all, y'all to focus on me for a second. He says this, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you let go of your life, you will save it. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit has been moving through the words of Jesus and the hard way lessons of Edith today. If you're here today and, you're, and you want to respond to what the Holy Spirit may be doing on your heart, like you, you, you feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit on your heart. I think it's important for us to respond to Anytime the God of heaven is wanting to get our attention. And and I'll say sometimes that message from God comes as a conviction, a feeling of, uh, of a desire to want to change something in our lives. It could be, it comes as this conviction that says the Holy Spirit kind of points out there's some things going on that you're doing that you need to stop doing. A lot of times, a lot of times, that's the entry point that the Holy Spirit decides to use into bringing you near Christ. Why is that? Why is it that so often it's the thing that, the the sinful thing that he wants to point at, to touch at? It's because God is holy. It's It's because in order to be near him, You have to repent of your sins. In order to be with him, you cannot be willfully sinning and and, and willfully uh, uh, belittling Christ's work on the cross. Jesus made a way of escape. He rescued us from those very things. The only thing that he requires from us is faith and to repent. That's it. Your part is to truly repent. And if that's you today, I want, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. Maybe it'll be at your seat. Maybe it'll be at your knees at the altar. Maybe it'll be, maybe you'll come up and receive prayer from one of the people who are going to be praying in a moment. But the God of heaven deserves a response if he is tugging on your heart. He sends his messenger to rescue us. And Jesus, the Messiah, has come to rescue you. No, he came for somebody else. He came for these people who deserve it. He came for you. I don't deserve it. No, none of us do. He came for you. I don't care what you've done. Well, if you knew what I did, preacher, you, you, wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. If Jesus doesn't care, I don't care. If Jesus is willing to lay his life down for you, that's good enough for me. I want to invite you to stand as we end. You know, I think that a Bible-believing church should give people an on-ramp to Christianity often. And this is an on-ramp. We don't do it every week. We actually don't do it enough. But this is an on-ramp. If you want to follow Jesus, today is your day. All you have to do is repent and believe. That's it. Repent and believe. And then after that, what comes is this new desire to want to obey Christ. You want to obey the Holy Spirit within. 
And it's out of that obedience that a life in Christ is built. And that's the, that's the simplest way that I can explain it to you. Repent because the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and he's pulling, pointing things to you and saying, hey, this is what we need to change. This is what you need to do. Repent, believe, and obey. That's it. I'm going to give you multiple ways that you can choose to respond to the Holy Spirit. You can respond by coming forward. You can respond by scanning the QR code that says, I have decided. Let us know and we'll have a pastor reach out to you. You can respond by coming up and talking to me or any of the altar workers that are here. Maybe you're here and you're like, man, I've, I've been a believer for a really long time and, and, and I've been lagging far behind, but I'm done with that. I don't want to lag behind anymore. I want to follow closely after Jesus. I'm, I'm one hard saying from Jesus away from falling off and turning my back on the only one who offers eternal life. I'm one hard saying away. I'm one accusation from Satan away. I'm one false claim from the world about who Jesus was away from falling away from the only one who has the words of eternal life. If that's you, it's time to pick up your pace and come run with us shoulder to shoulder as we follow Jesus even through the darkest and stormiest of times we, we, it's our goal to stay close enough where we can always see where he's going amen let's pray and Father I pray that you would seal the work that you've done on our hearts in worship this morning. Pray that you would seal the work that you've done on our hearts through this word, through these hard way lessons of Edith this morning. Lord, I pray you call every single person who needs prayer for anything whatsoever to come forward and receive what you have for them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.